Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Freddie Lawton from Business Review and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have ESCO and Media Beacon with us today who will be discussing leveraging packaging for great customer experiences by using digital assets management. Today's guest speakers are Susie Stitzel, Director of Product Marketing at Media Beacon, and John Elworthy, who is responsible for global business development and brand management at ESCO. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar platform on 24. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect for any reason, please just click on the link that you receive via email to rejoin the session. In order to ask questions, you can send them in via the questions widget. Just type them into the box at the top left-hand corner of your screen and click Submit. We will allocate around 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. Please use the yellow Help widget if you require any assistance and you can move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you to get a better view of the slides. But now, please allow me to welcome John. Thanks, Freddie. And let me add my own welcome to this webinar. Thanks for joining us for the next 40 minutes to an hour where, we'll, we, where we will be discussing how to leverage packaging for great customer experiences using digital asset management. We'll be looking at how this can help ensure brand consistency, and protect brand equity to reduce risks. I'm John Elworthy, and as I said, I'm responsible for global business development for our brand management sector at ESCO. And co-presenting this with me, I have Susie Stitzel. Hey, John. <clears throat> Happy to be here. So I think um, let's start off with a little bit of background here about what we mean by digital experiences and what I like to call the digital world mega trend. I think we could all agree that uh, there is a digital world um, mega trend happening, that companies are able to interact with customers across more and more digital touch points. It used to be that it was sort of the analog way. Um, you would interact with your customers from over the TV or over radio. But now with smartphones and tablets and the Internet, um, customers or companies are much more able to interact with their customers across more and more and more digital touch points. And the drivers for this, of course, are the increasing adoption of new technologies. We see that all the time. More and more smartphones, more and more tablets, more and more connected um, people. Growing amount of interrelated and meaningful data. So there's a lot of data, you know, sort of as a consumer, I find this a little creepy, but, uh, you know, I think we've all done a search for something and then come back later and found um, those searches being pre promoted to us. They know where we've been and what we were looking for. And that usability of that data, where we've been, what we're looking for, what we're shopping about. And then, um, Conversely, the difficulty in protecting that information. So there is this huge mega trend, um, good and bad, that where we need to be aware of how we give a consistent experience to consumers. I'm kind of a uh, data research junkie. I think John knows this. And uh, I came across this report not too long ago from um, the Consumer Goods Forum and Capgemini. Um, where they're really talking about the future value chain, so talking about that digital world. And this was a quote from that report where they're talking about um, how the digital world is changing consumers' lives and the way that they shop. It basically affects those moments of truth. Um, we think about the first moment of truth or the zero moment of truth. And, and because people are doing a lot of shopping and a lot of research digitally, um, it changes those critical points when shoppers are making choices. And what it means is that they expect to find information through multiple channels and multiple devices. They expect to be able to do this from anywhere um, through different types of devices, and they expect to find it very quickly. But they also expect that experience to be consistent, and that's a big challenge. Consistency regardless of where I'm searching for that information or what information I'm looking at on my phone or what I see on television, we want that to be consistent. One of the uh, wonderful data points that I use all the time to do research is a, is a newsletter from Google, Think with Google. I would encourage anybody who's interested in this kind of stuff to uh, sign up for this every day or every other day. I get something from them that has some fascinating research in it. There was a story about two months ago about Target, where um, mobile is the new front door for Target. And they had a, a data point in there where 98% of Target's customers shop digitally. I was totally blown away by this. I'm totally surprised that it's that high. 
and that three quarters of those people are starting their experiences on, on a mobile device. So that really um, led to this quote from Casey Carl, the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer for Target. He said that there's no longer a delineation between how their guests live life and how they shop. They shop whenever they have time, wherever they are. And the important thing is that the, they want the data to flow seamlessly across every one of their channels. And to make that happen, they recognize uh, that they need the right underlying architecture. So we need to uh, have a consistent experience, a digital experience, and an analog experience, regardless of how customers are shopping for us. A couple more um, interesting data points, uh, also from Think with Google. Um, mobile conversion rates have shot up by 29% in the last year. So uh, people are really converting over to mobile um, at a crazy pace. We've recognized this for years, but it is really accelerating, and it's accelerating globally um, around the world. Um, Two-thirds of smartphone owners use their phones to learn more about something they saw in a TV commercial. I don't know about you, John, but I do this all the time. I'm watching television, I see something go by, and I go, oh my goodness, I want to learn more about that, or that's really cool, I wonder how much it costs, and I go right to my phone. And then 67% of millennials agree that they can find a YouTube video on anything they want to learn. I do this as well. I kind of look for something, uh, how, do, how can I make that happen, or how do I do that? Um, cooking, uh, working, anything else, I can find something on anything that I want to learn. So it's true that this digital world megatrend is, is happening, it's true that it's accelerating, and um, I think it's really, really fascinating. So I know, John, you also like this kind of data. Yeah, that's fascinating, Susie. Um, it won't surprise you to learn I also like my research. Uh, I felt yep. that the recent strategy briefing I found from Euromonitor, who were looking at the move towards omnichannel retailing, was worth merit to discuss here. Um, omnichannel retailing, for those who it might be a new uh, uh, piece of terminology for, is where every touch point that the consumer has to the brand and or the retailer is harmonized regardless of where they are, whether they're in the store, whether they are online, whether they're on their mobile phone, or anywhere else where they might touch that brand. It's a huge challenge to achieve this consistent experience across all of those, di of those different touch points, be they analog or digital. I agree with the market drivers that Euromonitor State are pushing omnichannel retailing. There's definitely a consumer pull happening, and hey, we just talked about it. I definitely fall into that kind of consumer category myself as well. My smartphone and the web is an integral part of how my and my family's shopping experience happens these days, be it for Christmas presents, which, kind of, which is kind of topical right now, or be it for groceries, uh, or anything else that, that uh, I want to research or buy. But there's also other factors. Governments are investing heavily in infrastructure to improve our online capability, plus uh, add regulations to make the whole process a safer one. Technology, because of this and hey, because of the general pace of technology, is therefore advancing at a rapid pace. So that, combined with the consumer pool, is driving the retailers to try and lead the charge here. The same report looked at online retailing by country and found that the U.S. is by far the world's leading market for Internet retailing, with sales of $208 billion in 2013 alone, which has grown significantly since then. China has been catching up quickly, with sales reaching $99 billion. However, on a per-household basis, values are still pretty low in that market. The U.K. and Japan ranked third and fourth, respectively. Interestingly, sales in both Germany and France are growing significantly. In fact, they more than doubled in recent years. But, and in terms of online sales as a proportion of total retail sales, the most developed markets uh, found were South Korea, interestingly, and the UK, at 13% and 10% respectively. E-commerce remains virtually underdeveloped in emerging markets such as Venezuela, Malaysia, India, South Africa, Indonesia, the Philippines, etc., where fewer than 1% of all retail sales were made online. Nevertheless, sales have grown dramatically in these markets with key growth areas including Mexico and Indonesia. To me, the growth in online becomes most apparently with this slide, uh, with this data that I just put up. 
where we see that the growth in online sales in dark blue versus the store-based sales in light blue by, by uh, split by the key markets. Here you can see that the majority of retail growth is coming from online. Yeah, everything else so that leads flat. us into our first poll of the day. Uh, and in this poll, we're looking to understand if your organization has a digital distribution strategy for e-commerce. And for that, I'm going to hand over to Freddie. Great. Thank you, John. So uh, it's now time for the first poll that we'll be running in today's session. Audience members, if you could please select the answer that is relevant to you and then click Submit. So the question is, does your organization have a digital distribution strategy for e-commerce? Possible answers are, yes, we have a good handle on this, including packaging. Yes, but we don't consider packaging in it. We're working on it. No, or I don't know. Um, Susie and John, perhaps you could briefly comment on the question just to give our audience a bit more time to vote. Sure. Um, so this, here we're really trying to understand, is this something that people are really thinking about? And it could vary depending on, on where you come from as an attendee inside of this, uh, this webinar. Uh, but does e-commerce uh, form a key part of your uh, digital distribution strategy right now? And if so, does it include packaging? Yeah, I think Thank it's you, really John. interesting oh. because we think of uh, packaging as being sort of that analog experience, right? And, and here we're talking about digital experiences and how do those actually meet. So it would be interesting to see if people are, are thinking about this connection between the analog and the digital world. Thank you, guys. Let's have a look at the results. So we're fairly split there. Uh, number one answer there is we're working on it. So that's 37.9%. Uh, Susie and John, what do you think of these results? Interesting. Um, Somewhat, actually, I was kind of thinking it would be like this. this is the first time that I've uh, run a poll such as this with this question, and I was split as to which way it would go. I'm not surprised, I guess, is my first answer. Susie, any comment from you? Well, I, I think it's uh, interesting. I kind of expected we're working on it to be uh, kind of the leader. I think it's interesting of the of the people that do have a, a strategy, they don't consider packaging is very, very low, and I think that's an opportunity, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I, I'm, I'm certainly pleased to see a number of people who have a handle on this, including packaging. 13.8% is a is a decent chunk of chunk of people who are thinking about this in what we would presume to be the the right way. So that's good to good to hear. Thanks for the feedback, guys. So um, I'll continue from here. And to complete the, the research area, I thought it was also interesting to note this recent survey from Watermark Consulting, who were looking at uh, different companies' focus on consumer experience. Now, in their recent uh, survey, they found that the leaders who focused on overall consumer experience outperformed the broader market. They generated a total re return that was 35 points higher than the S&P 500 index, whereas the laggards who had less focus on consumer experience trailed far behind, posting a total return that was 45 points lower than that of the broader market. Now, there could be other factors at play, of course, here. But it's interesting to note that those guys, those companies that really have a focus on uh, complete consumer experience generally are performing higher than others. And I'll give a, a, a nice example of that. Um, probably an example that we can all relate to. All the data says that digital experience is what it's all about. But what did experience mean 10 years ago? It didn't mean digital. And you know what? Experience isn't an either or, it's an and. The best brands know this and live this every day. They're passionate about having a flawless customer experience in both the digital and the analog. Think about Coke. How that red can looks on the shelf matters, and it matters big time. Packaging is the ultimate analog touch point to your consumer, and therefore, we feel it must be integrated seamlessly into the growing number of digital touch points we've just been talking about. Personally, I love this, uh, this quote from Johnny Ive on Steve Jobs from his autobiography. I really never thought about packaging as being a ritual or theater until I got my first iPhone. These concepts seem far removed from typical packaging concerns of cost, weight, and protection. But it's important to remember that the customer experience for e-commerce products includes the way that the product lands on the customer's 
uh, mailbox or in their doorstep or how they open a package, how they interact with that product. And in that holds true whether it's something like an iPhone or something like a cereal bar or another food product. That first impression can make the product better and can make the brand more desirable, or it can have a negative perception that can tarnish both of them. And as a great example of this, uh, and a great proof that consumers care, I grabbed this unboxing video from the UK version of YouTube and in the UK alone, as of last week, nearly 3.5 million people have watched a video of someone opening that very box. And this is one of hundreds of similar videos on just the UK channel alone. I think that shows that the, the various digital touch points that we have to our analog touch points, as we've been talking about, are growing and matter more and more. With that, I'm going to pass back over to Susie. So, John, I think we can uh, see the connection between the, the, the digital and the uh, analog in some of those experiences, but is packaging really a digital customer experience um, when we're shopping before we actually have the product? Is it really a digital customer experience? And I think that's a fair question to ask, but it's pretty easy to answer it by um, doing a little research on using some apps or looking online, we can see that actually packaging is everywhere, uh, particularly for those products where packaging is the product, those consumer goods, food and beverage, health and beauty, the packaging is the product, and you see it everywhere. It's absolutely part of that digital experience. So we need to have the packaging. We need to be able to use it to promote the product, whether that's over the web, on our phone, via dedicated apps, or even in commercials or television. So what does that mean? We have all of these digital touch points, so how do you turn that into your own personal superpower? How do you leverage that? We agree, I think, that the digital world megatrend is real and it's here. Um, we also saw from some of the data that uh, John presented that customer experience is not just important, but it's also profitable. It's critical to profitability. And digital asset management should be a key component of that. It should be the key component to help you control the brand message and the voice and to create consistent and great customer experiences. And it also should be a driver internally for you to leverage the power of the assets that you already own, to increase your marketing efficiency, and to increase innovation. And digital asset management can help do that as well. So if I come back to that report at the very beginning, we talked about the, the Consumer Goods Forum Capgemini report. Um, they came up with these four crucial questions. And they are, how do I leverage the connected or the smart environment for a new quality of individual customer service? Here we're talking about customer service and meeting the customer regardless of where they are. How do I ensure that customers get the right information at the right time? How can I ensure that the consistency of the experience that is for consumers is, is good? And how do I manage and share the stewardship of all of that master data? How do I make sure that everything is being uh, managed correctly? And I think there are actually two parts of this story when we talk about packaging. The first part is how do we actually leverage digital asset management to produce the packaging? And then we'll talk about part two, which is once we have that packaging, what can we do with it? So, John, how about this topic? Yeah, okay. So how are tools today helping brands control that experience in both the digital and the analog? As Susie said, let's have a look into some ways that you can use DAM, tightly connected to work in progress, to drive the ability to truly embrace packaging within marketing. And there's a couple of different ways, places you could look to for that. The first area we're going to look to is in managing content. Here, we're talking about things like text, symbols, tables, barcodes, and such like. Content that could be marketing in nature, or it could be highly regulated. It's a growing challenge to keep up with the content requirements on packaging these days. And that's due to the increasing number of product versions on the market. Just think about uh, if you pop into your local store and see how many different versions of, of all the lovely products that you, you buy on a weekly basis there are, and how much they grow every month. There's an increasing number of versions on the market, but there's also increasing regulation. And there's an increasing demand due to that regulation and due to economies of scale for that same content to be repurposed across multiple analog and digital medium, mediums. Let's look at why, and look at, let's also look at what you can do about it. 
So firstly, this survey that was conducted by a leading brand concluded that the majority of packaging errors are due to the management of copy. It's a big challenge. And as you can see, these errors don't always get found in the production process either. And that can lead to some potential damage to your brand and consumer confidence. Uh, it's always funny to look at these examples, and I'm sure you've seen many, many more. They're all over the Internet. Uh, My look, personal it, favorite it, are those wine glasses, John, that are Fargo. I like the Fargo <laughs> I wine like glasses. those ones. <laughs> at yeah. least they won't break. Uh, so you'll see them all over the Internet. Um, but the reality is that these can be troublesome, right? We, we work really, really hard, both the brands and the service providing companies work really, really hard to try and get rid of these errors throughout the process. But the reality is due to the inefficiencies of the typical processes, we're fighting a losing battle. So let's have a look and see why. Um, firstly, I think it helps to describe the typical process. This is something that we get involved in a fair amount. Um, it happens because the fragmented na manual nature of the process. So typically, the the text copy, other content copy is authored, approved, and validated in a number of different documents or emails, hopefully in a digital manner, uh, and is sent to the internal or the external artwork department uh, to be made into packaging. At this point in time, it's copied and pasted into an artwork file, or sometimes it's retyped as that's quicker, especially if it's a, a, a redo of an existing version. Goes without saying, if you've ever copied and pasted things from even from an email into a, a, another file, you'll know that sometimes these things can go wrong. It can be a very yeah, error-prone process, <laughs> especially uh, when, as we're prone to do, we often make updates to the copy. You know, we we see the first proof version and we think, hey, that would be a little bit better if we change this to that. So then, put yourself in the position of the art worker who has a new content file. They have to look through to find out what's changed, and they have to make sure, find which artwork files that means have to be changed, open up those files, and copy and paste again just those bits that have changed into those numerous files. I think I speak from experience here when I say it can be a very painful process. I certainly would not want that responsibility. <laughs> Indeed. It's, uh, I know many people, I've met with many people in the past who have that responsibility, and they generally have less hair than me, which is not much. Um, <laughs> so uh, there is, however, as I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear, a better way. Uh, we believe that your content statements, be they be marketing or regulated copy uh, or tables, they should be stored as individual assets in exactly the same way that you would do imagery. This should then be synchronized into packaging files using smart applications in the same way that they should be synchronized into your web content or other digital or analog channels. Synchronizing them to the packaging files, however, is the tough bit because it's a, it's a pretty complex process. But handily, as ESCO is the leader in packaging design and artwork software, we're in prime place uh, to make this project work. And it's not just us talking about it. Industry Standards Group GS1 agree with us too. We pioneered this technology together with a handful of leading brands, and GS1 have ratified it and now promote it as a global standard. GS1 say that the benefits of this are found in separating content from presentation, and that the brand becomes the master of the content, with creative being the master of design. They also say that the results guarantee that the correct content gets onto the right package. It gives confidence to make late stage changes with the confidence that it will work. That it brings the ease of generating line extensions and language variations so we can increase that. And it importantly means that we can know what is on the package in the field. If we have a ingredient content change that we have to make because, of, hey, hopefully there isn't, but maybe there's a problem. We can know exactly from looking at our system of record what that means we have to do, and we can make those changes with confidence. And that's really, really important. From that, I'm going to lead into our second and last poll of the day. And in this, we want to know if you feel that control over content is important. So I'll pass back over to Freddie. 
Thank you, John. Yeah, it's time for the second poll that we'll be running in today's session. Audience members, once again, if you could please select the answer that is relevant to you and then click Submit. So the question is, is control over content important? Potential answers are, yes, we have a good handle on this. Yes, but we don't have a good handle on it. We get it, but don't know where to start. No, or I don't know. Once again, Susie and John, perhaps you could briefly comment on the question? Well, I think uh, I think it's kind of a leading question in a certain way because clearly content is important, um, particularly in the regulated industries. But uh, more to the point is, you know, do people feel confident that they can handle this, especially in the face of changing regulations, which are really happening a lot more these days? I don't know about you, John, but yeah, I've spoke to a number of people about this challenge recently, and. Uh, some of the more honest people have talked about this as, as, a, as a huge challenge. Uh, it's not that this challenge hasn't existed before, uh, because it's always been a challenge, but with the increasing levels of regulation and the increasing complexity of the content that goes on to packaging uh, and the increasing demand, as we've been talking about before, for it to be repurposed onto multiple different other mediums, um, it's something that a lot of people, certainly that I've been talking to, are, are struggling for how do they do it well. So I'm, I'm super intrigued to, to see what the results are. Great. Thank you both. Let's have a look at the results. Um, again, fairly split there between the top two answers there, but it's the second one. Yes, but we don't have a good handle on it, leading with 55.2%. Susie and John, what do you reckon? Yeah, that backs up kind of what I was saying before. Um, one thing I, I think is really interesting is this is a question that we have run in various different guises um, before in, in, in different sessions. If we were even one year ago, I'm going to say maybe two years ago, I think you'd have seen a much more distribution across of the uh, across the, the lower um, answers. I see more and more companies either having a good handle on this or at least starting to try and find out how to do it, uh, which, which proves that the, the scale of the challenge uh, and the people are working on it. Yeah, I think so too. I'm pretty, you know, I think it's definitely important and everybody is pretty much agreeing with that or most people are agreeing with that. Um, it's just what do you do about it, right? Indeed. Indeed. Fantastic. Thanks for the feedback. All right, so we talked about using uh, digital asset management to actually produce packaging, but there's a second part to this story, which is now that we've done that, how do we use DAM to leverage that packaging for the customer experience? That's the second part of the story. And I would say to you that packaging is everywhere, even when it's not packaging. You see this all over the place. You see packaging on flyers. We saw it on a website. We saw it on a mobile app. We see it on billboards. Um, here it is on the side of a truck and even coupons. The packaging is basically the product and the packaging is everywhere, even when it's not packaging. So these things um, are being leveraged from somewhere and the consistent experience is the most important thing here. So let's talk about that. Typically, we talk about having some system of record. We believe that um, DAM, Digital Asset Management, should be that system of record and the single system of record. I've run into uh, multiple companies where they say, yes, we do have DAM, we do have Digital Asset Management, and we have one for the creative people, and we have one for the marketing team, and we have one for um, you know, the e-commerce team. And if you have multiple systems of record, then I would suggest that actually you don't have a digital asset management system because chances are that that data is duplicated. So there should be one and only one system of record uh, you know, in, in this uh, workflow. And it should provide a bunch of different features. But we talked about how it actually can be leveraged to produce packaging. And once we've produced that packaging, we know a lot of different things about the packaging now. We get information back. We know about things like size and shape. We know um, what barcode it is. 
We know what images and logos are being used. That can be really important when we have licensing or digital rights management on some of those images. I only have the rights to use this uh, football star um, for a certain period of time, and then I can no longer use it. We need to know those things. The marketing copy, of course. Um, then there's all the regulatory parts. Uh, what's the net weight, the ingredients, warnings, allergy information. All of this information is going on to the pack, and now we have a chance to actually be able to ask the packaging, you know, what is your barcode? Do you have this warning? And we can sort of close that loop that John drew from um, the system of record out to the artwork and coming back. Do you actually have this warning copy because this is what you're supposed to have? Once we have all of that information, once we know all of those things, we know exactly what ink hits substrate. We know what ink is actually on the package itself. And then we can leverage that in all of our other channels. Packaging is one channel, but we have a lot of other channels like e-commerce, web content management, over social media, and then systems that we might use like uh, product information management systems or marketing resource management systems or our business systems like ERP. And once we have all of that information, then using the digital asset management system, we can leverage that into all of these other channels. So let's think about that for a minute. How do we do that? Well, there are a lot of different ways to do that. One of the critical features about a digital asset management system is that you sh it should be easy to integrate into all of these other systems that you might have. That's one thing to really think about and think about how that single system of record can be used to drive these different channels. They all have um, great features and functionalities to service the channel itself, but the digital asset management system should really be that backbone that runs underneath all of these things. So we know some things, so what can we do with that? Well, for instance, we can get some brand consistency all the way across every single channel. We know what happened, what hit the packaging, and so the packaging can see, be the same in e-commerce, over the web, produced on packaging, on social media. Brand consistency all the way across every single channel. Think about that. Life is 3D. I like to say life is 3D and so is packaging. We know that packaging is really that ultimate 3D analog experience. But what can we do with that even before the packaging has been produced? Well, once we know these things, size, shape, um, what's on the package itself, we can use 3D modeling within the digital asset management system to, to virtually hold the product in your hand before the packaging has even been produced. And this is a critical point here. We wait for the packaging to be produced before we can launch a lot of other activities. We have activities, um, we have web activities, we have flyers, we have special promotions, we have coupons. And w if we're waiting for the packaging to be produced, then we can't start all of those other things until we have it. But being able to have this 3D model that we can leverage before it's even been printed allows us to do a lot of really fancy things and to accelerate that marketing project, project those marketing projects. If I have that 3D model, what could I do with it? I could do a digital photo shoot right from that 3D model. I could produce the images that I need for my website or that I need to send to my salespeople to actually put before buyers um, at my retailers. I can create the digital photo shoot without waiting for the packaging to come in. I set it up in a photo studio. I take shots of it. I retouch them in Photoshop everything else, all of that that's involved. Instead, we can do this virtually these days. Or there might be a need for being able to see the different sides of the packaging. What does the front, the back, the left, the right, the top look like? What is the panel with the nutrition facts? Where is that and what does it say? Being able to produce these images on demand from that single source is a fantastic time saver. And it's also reducing risk because we know that what's on that model and what's in these images is actually what hit the substrate and is on the packaging. So again, closing that loop that John was talking about. What's something else that we could do with this? If we are able to generate these types of images on demand, what could we do with that? We could do what's called creating the digital contact sheet. A lot of times we have contact sheets or catalogs of our different products or different shots, different images of our products that we want to be able to show to others or we want to be able to share with our retailers or our partners. And these contact sheets, again, on the fly, on demand, right from the 3D model, and I don't even have the packaging yet. It's still in printing, it's still out there at my converters, but I already am able to start some of these other activities. 
And you can imagine that being able to take these sorts of uh, images would help me actually promote over the web. I can share well with others, like my content management system. So being able to produce these images for the web, um, for my online retailing, for my e-commerce sites, and being able to produce those images is one thing. But what if then I could ask that image, what about your nutrition facts? What does it look like? And be able to retrieve that and display it over the web and know that that was the same thing that actually is out in the field. Again, sort of closing that loop. This is an interesting idea because I think there are opportunities here to do something like A-B testing. I'm trying a couple different packaging ideas, a couple different colors, and even before I um, dedicate a printing press and actually printed material to this, I could actually do some A-B testing about, you know, what's the better look and feel? What do people um, click on most? What are they most attracted to? Almost like consumer insights early on in the process. And John, I, you and I talked about a, a great example that you saw, um, which was this one. And I thought this was a really fascinating story. You should tell it uh, for the folks here. Yeah, this is an interesting article I, I picked up on a few weeks ago. Um, and it concerns Nestle. Uh, Nestle's upmarket Calia brand that they uh, recently launched. So they, they recently launched this, uh, this, this brand, which during its introductory period will, along with being sold in limited retail stores, be marketed on Amazon.com. Uh, and their head of confectionery said that this will allow them to make agile changes to customer feedback before a full launch. That I think it's very interesting. And a, and a typical example of A-B testing, as Susie was just discussing, and a great example of how a brand, which in this space, Nestle is somewhat of a challenger, uh, how they can use this technology um, to try and take a decent position in the market. It's going to be really interesting to follow this one. Personally, I know I'll, I'll follow this to see uh, how well it works. Indeed. So that's incredibly interesting. Um, and, okay, and they're thinking so, they're going to change the packaging along the way there? Sorry, go back to that. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's exactly what they're talking about, Susie. They're, they're talking about uh, changing the packaging along, along the way, along with the, potentially even the formulation of the, of the product itself, uh, according to customer feedback. So Amazon gives a great example, or gives a great um, a vehicle, let's say, for consumers to give feedback. Those of you who've shopped on Amazon, as I have um, many times, will know that the, uh, the, the, the consumer reviews are, are critical um, to typically your choice of a product, and they can sometimes be somewhat honest, let's say. Um, so Nestle are <laughs> seeking to use that as, as as a way of gathering quick customer feedback. I think it's, it's uh, for me, it's absolutely fascinating what they're going to do. Yeah, great. Okay. So um, coming towards the end, in summary, um, we set out here today to talk about leveraging packaging for great customer experiences using digital asset management to ensure brand consistency and protect brand equity. Our key learnings from the research that, that Susie and I did and the technology we, we explored and, and discussed today was to ensure that the consumers get the right information in the right place at the right time. And in doing that, we can summarize two keys to controlling your brand. Firstly, ensure consistency that your brand should always deliver its message in its own voice within its strict guidelines. And secondly, to drive automation. So you should be the one to tell the asset, be it an image or a video, some text, a packaging file, or a 3D, where it should be used. And you should be thinking about automating as many manual processes as possible during its creation and distribution to reduce risk. In doing so, you then make sure that wherever your brand goes, it stays your brand. Yeah, really important. Really, really important. So I think um, we can all agree that packaging is an analog and a digital experience. I mean, I think most people these days would have thought that anyway, but the connection between the two is the difficult bit. And uh, consistency is really the key to protecting the brand equity. What I see on the web, what I buy on the web, must be the same as what arrives at my door. And that system of record um, really can and really should be the bridge between those analog and digital worlds because 
what we're really trying to do is create great digital customer experiences, great consumer experiences, and I like to say create consistently great digital experiences.